ironic. After untold millions of years, this pterodactyl has claimed a new victim, a male specimen of Homo sapiens, which has been pinned to the floor by the pterodactyl's monstrous beak. The pterodactyl is cold and lifeless, which is not unusual since it's been dead for millions of years. You don't suspect it died from foul play, but you never know. Though it hardly seems appropriate, you marvel at the intricacy of the construction. The pterodactyl has been covered with authentic animal hide of some sort, stretched over a rigid framework. There's nothing suspicious about it, however. The corpse is wearing a black tuxedo jacket. At the moment, it's a poor fit, especially around the neck. You search the pockets and find nothing but the usual lint. You decline to take the jacket with you since it apparently contains no clues and is skewered to the floor anyway. That's odd. The corpse refuses to reply. Perhaps it's because his mind is... elsewhere. Your careful observation reveals that this is a rented tuxedo bearing the marks of repeated alterations. There is a stain above one pocket. A whiff reveals the strong, fresh scent of champagne. You examine the pants currently being worn by the lifeless body on the floor. They're tuxedo pants with a thin stripe of satin up the side of each leg. The pants are stained with the usual fluids that seep out during death, which explains the smell, but you find nothing unusual. damp and you're getting much too personal, Laura. Close inspection reveals that these rented tuxedo pants have been altered many times. There's a small mustard stain on one leg. The left arm and hand are splayed out to the side. A quick glance reveals nothing grasped in the hand or up the sleeve. You move the arm and it flexes easily. Rigor mortis is not yet set in. You search the left arm for clues but come up empty-handed. The right hand of this unfortunate soul is flung out to the side. The right hand and arm bend easily. Rigor mortis has not had a chance to set in find a large grease stain on the right sleeve. You give it a quick whiff and identify the scent of turkey hors d'oeuvres. A large pool of blood has formed around the corpse. It has barely begun to congeal, indicating that the incident must have taken place within the past few minutes. You gently touch the pool of blood. It's very slightly coagulated. Blood has begun to clot, darkening and thickening. It's difficult to judge whether or not this blood is primarily from the neck wound or the point where the pterodactyl's beak impaled the body. Or both. mask exhibit. You haven't seen this many dead-looking expressionless faces since your accounting class at the university. You gently palpate the room and the diagnosis is normal. It seems to be covered with a paint-like substance, probably paint. Appears to have been applied quite some time ago. Hmm. It's the head of a Cro-Magnon man. My, how people have changed. It's the head of a Ramapithecus man. 
It's the head of an Australopithecus man. Poor little fellow. The plaque says there were animal tooth marks in his skull. The head is from Mongolia. You've heard that the Mongols would have taken over the world if their pony's legs hadn't been so short. It's the head of a Neanderthal man. He looks so... brutish. This is the head of a Smeltdown man. You've heard rumors that Smeltdown man just may be a hoax. The head is attractive. But you'd never stoop to stealing. What fine craftsmanship. This appears to be the head of an Eskimo. You wonder if they really do use every part of a seal. This head from Greenland somewhat resembles the head from Alaska. This head is French-Canadian. You wonder if French Canadians are anything like Creoles and Cajuns. The head looks like that of a North American Plains Indian. You've read many exciting stories about the American Indian. The Panamanian head looks a little worried. The South American head has strong, regular features. The head is from Brazil. It reminds you of your great-aunt Marjorie, who went to Brazil to treat her brain fever and never came back. This head is from England. You ponder whether or not he always looked so grim. A head from Eastern Europe. You think of Romania, Turkey, Gypsies. A head from Algeria. Imagine! This head is from Arabia. Your thoughts are suddenly filled with tales of the Arabian Nights. This person lived off the Ivory Coast. How exciting! The head is a life cast of a denizen of Central Africa. You suddenly remember that the Africans developed bronze casting techniques hundreds of years before the Europeans. This head is from the Mozambique area of Africa. How exotic! This head is from the Cape region of Africa. This head is from India. You close your eyes, smelling the incense, hearing the temple bells. This head is from the Russian steppes. It's the head of an Australian Aborigine. He looks elemental and wise. This head is from China. You'd love to visit China someday. says that this is the missing link. Well, he's hardly missing if he's right here on the wall. This head is from Japan. You wonder if he was a samurai. doesn't look like a life mask. It's... 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 Ziggy's head! You reach out sadly towards Ziggy's severed head, then draw away. He's clearly beyond all help. What is going on in here? I'd say you've got some explaining to do, young lady. Why are you screaming? Uh, found 
Mr. Ziggy's head. Very odd how you are always finding the bodies, Miss Bo. I think we should be going back to my office and interrogating you now. Here now, Wolf. The young lady just found a man's head. Give her a moment before you get out your thumb screws, then. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Don't thank me, lass. I'm not saying you didn't kill the man. I'm just trying to restrain Mr. Heimlich's enthusiasm for his job. But I will get the results. Let me talk to her privately. Now I realize you're just trying to help, Wolf. But I think we can learn what we need from the lass without harming her. She could lie and you'd never know it. You Americans are too soft on your criminals. I just walked in and found his head, that's all. Well, Mr. Heimlich does have his point, lass. It's a wee bit curious that you keep showing up at the murder scenes before anyone else. How do you explain that, then? Just lucky, I guess. Well, you do seem a wee bit small to be sawn off a man's head, I'll say that much. Thanks. The Sprawline could have had help, or maybe she's very clever. Or maybe you're trying to pin the murders on her, so you can find the murderer and save your job, eh? My job is quite secure, Herr O'Reilly. Oh, really now? A security chief who allows burglars to steal the exhibits, then overlooks several murders happening under his nose. I'd think twice about your security methods if I was running things here. This is hardly the place to discuss my methods here, O'Reilly. We have a suspect to interrogate. Correction. We have a murder scene to investigate. We can talk to the last later when she's had a chance to calm down. Thank you again, sir. You're a sturdy one, I'll say that much for you. One scream and you've got your head together again, so to speak. Uh, just don't try to leave the museum. I can't leave. I'm locked in. Good. We won't have to worry about you then. All right, Wolf. We've got work to do. Let's go get the crime scene tools. cutter with a red blade, the red stain on the paper cutter blade could be red ink or blood, perhaps the last person to use it had an accident? Miss Bo, this is a private office. Oh, well I was just looking around. Have you seen this paper cutter? It looks like it has blood on the blade. Blood? Oh, that's not blood. You got me all excited. It's probably just red ink. But if you're worried about Yvette, I just saw her on the way down to Ernie's office in the basement. She goes down there a lot for some reason. She's fond of Ernie? Yvette is very fond of everyone, my dear. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some business to attend to.
three very long tubular shapes like lengths of thick rope are floating in the murky liquid. Poking around among the mass of dead snakes in this vat seems very similar to stirring spaghetti in a pot of water, except for the smell. Boy, the alcohol fumes sure are strong in here. Vat 4. A bulky creature with a huge head is floating in the vat. There's a dead hippo in this vat, and he's not happy. Rather than poking around his body with a net, you should probably just let him rest in peace. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. The intercom crackles and you hear... Ernie, it's Olympia. The release valve in number 13 seems to be jammed. Take a look at it when you have a chance. This is the storage room that has been converted to an office for Ernie Leach. Best to leave this room right where it is, otherwise Ernie won't be able to find it when he comes looking for it. Up close, you can see that somebody wasted a lot of good storage space in here, with some rather inefficient placement of the storables. The world's first blender, invented 50,000 years ago by a Neanderthal named Boog. Instead of a motor, it was powered by a pair of gerbils running in a crude treadmill. Considered impractical by the other Neanderthals, Boog's invention was forgotten until 1922 when it was reinvented by Stephen J. Poplowski of Wisconsin for the purpose of mixing malted milkshakes. At that time, the blender was known as a vibrator. Stephen made a fortune from it. Boog should also have invented the first patent. A collection of Anasazi polychrome pottery from the cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde in Colorado. An interesting shell specimen, formerly belonging to a leaping nautilus. The leaping nautilus was rather an unsuccessful creature since it is now extinct. Obviously, this one is a mere shell of its former self. Ernie's private boxed collection of World War I souvenirs. It's a bust of Nefertiti, Egyptian queen of the 14th century BC and wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten. Wampeters, Foma grand balloons and assorted oddments. A fine stuffed example of the African giant pouched rat, also known as the Gambian pouched rat. Found from Gambia in the west to the Sudan and Kenya in the east and southwards to the Transvaal. Nearly three feet long. Discovered by R. Meinertshagen, who tracked this rat for years before cornering it in a sleazy bar in Kenya. Two interesting skull specimens from early humans who don't need them anymore. It's a stuffed bear. skeletal specimen of the saber-toothed jackalope, discovered high on the frozen slopes of Mount Everest. Extinct for over 20,000 years, scientists speculate that this jackalope was in the process of climbing the highest peak in the Himalayas when it died suddenly of arthritis. A wood display pedestal. Currently nothing is displayed on it. A mop, complete with bucket. Apparently they haven't been used for a while since they're stuck to the floor. A mop and a broom. Tiny locks secure them to the wall, since the cleaning man is worried about people stealing his cleaning supplies. An old toolbox. A pair 
number of heavy duty wire cutters. There's a bit of rust on the wire cutters as well as an odd bit of beige coat fabric. You pick it up and place it in your purse. This curious device is a lasso at the end of a pole, used for the humane capture of snakes in the wild, or wild snakes, or something like that. It's inscribed with the words, Acme Snake Lasso. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Index to the stored items in the alcohol vats. Current fat contents, alcoholic preservation lab. 1. Koala bears. 2. Turtles. 3. Snakes. 4. Hippo. 5. Ground sloth. 6. Skunks. 7. Loch Ness Monster. 8. Ostrich. 9. Lemmings 10. Unicorn 11. Creature from the Black Lagoon 12. Rats 13. Warthogs 14. King Edward of Daventry One of those newfangled intercom units this appears to be a large button on the wall. This is a private office, Miss Bow. Please leave. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Leach. I thought this was just a storage room. I'll leave now. A large, hairy creature with at least one huge claw is floating in the murky liquid of the vat. Ground sloths are very slow creatures. Since the sloths in this vat are dead, they're even slower than usual. However, you quickly come to the conclusion that probing around in this vat with a net is a waste of time. Boy, the alcohol fumes sure are strong in here. Vat 6. Small furry creatures about the size of the average dog, colored black with white stripes, are floating in the vat. This vat gives off the delicate aroma of alcohol mixed with skunk, possibly because it's full of skunks, and nothing else. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. Vat 7. Whatever is in this vat, it's huge, with a long neck. The liquid is too murky to see more. If you believe your eyes, the Loch Ness Monster is in this alcohol vat. Now you know why this museum has such a fine reputation for its collection of alcoholic specimens. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. Vat 8. A thick body with two long bird-like legs and a long neck ending in a small head floats in the vat. When you've seen one dead ostrich floating in a vat of alcohol, you've seen them all. Perhaps there's a lesson in this. Don't bury your head in the sand, but don't bury it in a vat of alcohol either. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. Vat 9.
tiny furry creatures, too cute for words, are floating in the murky liquid. There are so many of them in here that their individual shapes merge together into one massive fur ball. They're small, cute, furry, and dead. They're lemmings. The group in this vat seems to have committed mass suicide by drowning themselves in alcohol. Such are the dangers of drinking and driving. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. Vat 10. Is that a unicorn floating in the murky liquid? Can't be. Unicorns are mythical creatures. Probing around in the vat with the net, you find nothing more than an ordinary dead unicorn, possibly left over from a King's Quest game. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. with a hand crank on the base. Closer examination reveals these words on the base of the lantern. Rumkoff's coil consists of a coil of copper wire insulated by a silk covering surrounded by another coil of fine insulated wire in which a momentary current is induced when a current is passed through the inner coil from a voltaic battery charged by a hand crank. When the apparatus is in action, the gas becomes luminous, producing a white and continued light. The lantern will burn beneath the deepest waters and safely among flammable gases. M. Rumkoff, an able and learned chemist, discovered the induction coil. In 1864, he obtained the great French prize for this ingenious application of electricity. Not only that, but he was a great dancer too. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Looks like broken glass. the body of President Archibald Carrington III. It's the dead body of Archibald Carrington III. From the position of the corpse, you suspect foul play. Porcupine quills, which appear to have caused Dr. Carrington's demise as they passed through his body, creating multiple perforations in many of his vital organs. There's blood on the porcupine quills. From their position in his body, you infer that the blood belongs to Dr. Carrington. Spiny Norman, former stuffed porcupine desk decoration, is now squashed under the weight of Carrington's corpse. Don't touch the evidence. 
The porcupine's eyes have bugged out of his head under the great weight of Dr. Carrington. It's dripping blood. You presume the dripping blood belongs to Carrington, since the porcupine was stuffed. Dr. Carrington's head holds no clues that you can discover, except for the somewhat pained expression on his face. Carrington drooled a bit when he died, and his hair could have used a good wash to get all the grease out of it. It's the pale right hand of Carrington's corpse. The fingers are showing signs of lividity. Rigor mortis has not yet begun to set in, allowing you to move the fingers freely. The fingernails hold no clues, but the right index finger has blood on the end of it, although there are no cuts evident on the hand. It's the pale left hand of Carrington's corpse. The fingers are showing signs of lividity. Neither the fingernails nor the fingers hold any clues. It's Carrington's desk, which is now the scene of his demise as well. The clock appears to have been broken at exactly 12.04 a.m. The glass on the clock face appears to have been smashed during a struggle. Whether it was a struggle to wind the clock, or a struggle for Carrington's life, it's hard to say for certain. Two letters written in blood on the desktop. You see two letters written in blood. CP. The letters C and P are carefully written in blood on the desk, as if they were put there by the dying President Carrington. Evening, Countess. What are you doing here? I just happen to be hiding behind the tapestry. You're lying. How could you tell? Nobody just happens to hide behind a museum tapestry. And nobody just walks around inside a museum late at night with paintings under their arms. Paintings? Oh, you mean these paintings? Ah, uh, I just found them laying around on the floor and I picked them up so no one would step on them. I don't think so. You don't think so? Are you accusing me of something, you silly girl? What do you think? I think you're a rude girl who needs to learn some manners. The nerve going around accusing people of stealing paintings. Did I say anything about you stealing them? Well, of course you did. Don't try to trick me, girl. I've got more tricks than you have brain cells. One thing I have to ask myself is, why did you bring those paintings to a meeting with Dr. Carrington this time of night? How did you know I was meeting Dr. Carrington? 
I found a note beside his body. His body? You talk about him like he was dead. Yes, he is. Dead as a doorknob. You didn't know about it? You're trying to trick me again. Dr. Carrington is alive and well and working in his office. Well, you're right about him being in his office, but he's quite dead, I assure you. Oh, my God! And you seem to be a logical murder suspect. Wait a second. You're not going to pin this one on me. I didn't have anything to do with it. Why would I want to kill him? We've got a perfectly good art burglary scheme going. Art burglary? Uh, I think I said too much. If you're trying to convince me that you're not the murderer, you're not doing a very good job of it. What do I care what you think anyway? You're not a cop. But I am a reporter, and I could write about you in the newspaper. Of course, your reputation would be ruined, and the police would get very interested in you. But you're tough, so I'm sure you could handle it. Look, it was just a little deal I worked out with Dr. Carrington. An art forger duplicates the paintings on the wall of the gallery. Then we hang them up in place of the real ones, which we sell to private collectors. Didn't you think someone would catch on after a while? Are you kidding? That's the beauty of the plan. When we had replaced all the paintings, we were going to slash them and make it look like someone vandalized the real paintings. No one would ever think we'd go to the trouble of forging paintings just to destroy them. And Carrington is here to see that no one gets too nosy. You mean he was here? I swear I didn't have anything to do with his death. He was my cash cow. I brought him over from Europe just for this reason. Now that's it. I'm not saying any more about it. You're not looking well, Countess. There's a murderer running around loose in this museum, so I do feel a bit spooked when someone leaps out from behind the exhibits. I don't feel like talking about that now. This is one of the three wires that formerly suspended the pterodactyl from the ceiling. You pull the thin wire. It remains steadfastly attached to the pterodactyl. This is one of the three wires that did a less than satisfactory job of keeping the pterodactyl suspended over the museum floor near the overhead catwalk. You yank on the wire. It's very strong and firmly attached to the pterodactyl. You examine the free end of the wire. It's been clipped cleanly with a slight bend a centimeter or two beneath the cut end. This was no accident. You pick it up and place it in your purse. I never use such rude implements, Miss Bow. Those are for common people. Oh dear, what in the world could that be? Oh, I don't know a thing about lanterns, dear girl. I try to stay out of dark, frightening places, don't you? thing to ask about, dear girl.
One of the skeletons in the Bosch painting appears to be holding an object that glints in the light. With careful use of the wire cutters, you manage to remove the skeleton key without damaging the Bosch painting. I can do for you, Miss Bolt? What are you looking at? Don't touch me, lady. Mr. Leach, can you let me out of this museum? I don't like it in here. People keep dying. Sorry, Miss Bolt. I seem to have lost my door keys. Oh, I find that very disturbing. Me too. I can't even let myself out of the building. We're all staying here until I find those keys. Mr. Leach, has 1926 been a good year for you? Yes or no, Miss Pope. Times are tough, but at least I've got this job at the museum. That's more than a lot of folks have. Do you like your job here at the museum? Yes, I do. This sort of work doesn't really tax my brains, if you know what I mean. It gives me time to think. Think about what, Mr. Leach? <laughs> you sure act like a reporter, Miss Bo. Mr. Leach, do you have any idea who might have taken the dagger of Amon Ra? I sure don't. Well... I halfway wonder if it wasn't one of those Egyptian fellows. <laughs> they probably think I took it. Was the dagger well guarded? Oh sure. It was locked up tighter than a tighter than a drum. Somebody really pulled a fast one. Do you know much about Egyptology, Mr. Leach? No, Miss Bo, I really don't. I think it's very interesting though. I picked up a book about it in the museum shop, but I haven't had time to read it yet. Hey, that's some of that Egyptian writing. I've seen it in the Ancient Egypt exhibit. Dr. Carter sure is proud of that display. Do you like New York City, Mr. Leach? New York's my home, Miss Bo. I was born and raised here, and it's in my blood. Sometimes I think I'd like to go somewhere else, where life is a little slower. But to tell you the truth, I don't think I could ever really leave. At first, I wasn't sure I'd like it here in this big spooky old place. But it was so peaceful at night, and there's so many interesting things everywhere. I really enjoy it now. That's a pretty good paper you work for, Miss Bo. I read through it every morning at breakfast. Our local cops are okay, I, I guess. They never give me too much of a hard time. I've heard there are some bad apples on the force, though. At least it isn't as bad as Chicago. I don't go to a laundry, Miss Bo. I wash my own clothes. It saves a few pennies. I'm not fond of the docks myself, Miss Bo. I did a short stint over there a couple of years back. I got treated like a dog and nearly got squashed flat by a huge crate of oranges one time. No thank you. Well, 
A lot of people think those places are the cat's pajamas. I used to go to them a lot, right after I got back from the war. I don't so much anymore. Actually, I've never met the gent. Fried follow? Isn't it one of those fancy French pastries? I've never met the fellow. I don't know your daddy, Miss Bo, but I'm sure he's a good fellow. Now there's a weaselly little fellow. I've heard he's a stool pigeon. That's a dangerous way to make a living. Oh, I guess he's an okay fella. For a cop. I do wish he'd stop leaving those grape stems all over the place though. If that fella were any more full of himself, he'd rise up and float away like a hot air balloon. The way he carries on, you'd think he discovered Atlantis. Well, I don't see the gent too often. We working class folks don't see the big guys too often, you know what I mean? Dr. Miklos is a strange bird, but she's a decent sort all the same. I see her a lot at night working late. Sometimes she invites me in for coffee. She certainly is taken with a plate in my head. She must have looked at the scars a dozen times. Miss Delacroix is a wonderful lady, Miss Bo. A delight to work for. That fella gives me the willies. He's always hanging around, looking over my shoulder with those suspicious eyeballs of his. Also, to tell you the ugly truth, I just haven't trusted the Germans since the war. That Kaiser guy was a real high hat. You fought in the Great War, Mr. Leach? Yes, I did, Miss Bo. I came back with a plate in my head and a chest full of medals, and then I couldn't get a job to save my soul. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, don't let it bother you, Miss Bo. I'm just John. I'm doing fine. Oh, he seems like a nice enough fella. I don't know him too well. The Countess is a quite colorful old dame, isn't she? I can't help liking her. He's a quiet little fella. I think he does some accounting for the museum. Seems nice enough. Well, he's an intense sort of a gent. He's all been out of shape about this dagger business, and he hangs around Dr. Carter a lot. He looks ready to blow a blood vessel to me. That, that's me, Miss Bo. Ernie Leach. I thought you reporters were supposed to have good memories. No, I can't say I ever met the man. I guess most of you reporter sorts keep a notebook. Right, Miss Bo? Be kind when you write about me. Well, isn't that interesting, Miss Bo? I guess you reporters have to look carefully for your clues. You don't have to carry a glass around with you, Miss Bo. You can get a drink anytime you want from the refreshment table. Oh, this whole place is full of bones, Miss Bo. If you want to know what it is, ask Dr. Miklos. sure, but I think it's one of those Egyptian symbols. They've got a million of them.
Yeah, I've noticed old Pippin carrying a notepad around. He probably wrote down some nasty comments for future reference. I don't have much use for carbon paper. You might ask that Ramsey's fella. He's a bean counter. He probably uses it. Hmm. We burned charcoal in the museum furnace, Miss Bo. It might have come from there. Good lord! That fella has a rap sheet a mile long. I hope I never meet up with him. Now, where did you get that, Miss Bo? Maybe you should put that away. Well, I've got wire cutters in my toolbox, Miss Bo. They come in handy. What in the world is that? I don't have anything like that in my toolkit. That's a high quality lantern. My cousin Bobby uses one just like it. He works in a mine in Pennsylvania. We use heavy gauge wire to hang our suspended exhibits, as we call them. It's got to be strong so none of those prehistoric birds land on some tourist's head. Mr. Leach, have you ever seen this key before? No, I can't say I have. It sure is strange. Do you have any idea what it might open? No, I don't. But you might ask Dr. Miklos. It looks like something she would appreciate. I've got some of my own, Miss Bowen. You be careful with those. They're awful sharp. Well, isn't that a beauty? That sure is one nice lantern. Miss Bow, put that away. Someone might see it. Now that's a pretty thing. It looks Egyptian. No thank you. I don't need one. Don't look at me so close, Miss Bo. I'm not that much to see. Oh, you keep it. The museum won't miss it. No thanks. I don't use it all that often. I've got a coffee cup of my own, Miss Bo. No, Miss Bo. I don't want to get involved in that. Vat 11. Something odd is floating in the murky liquid. It appears to be half man and half fish. Or maybe it's just a trick of the light. Probing around in the vat with the net, you find nothing more than a creature from the Black Lagoon. Boy, the alcohol fumes sure are strong in here. Vat 12. Small creatures with long tails are floating in the murky liquid. Probing around among the floating rat corpses with your net, you are startled to find many more floating rat corpses. Oh well. The strong fumes are making you dizzy. Vat 14. There's a vaguely humanoid shape floating in the murky liquid. After 
staring through the glass for a while, you see what appears to be white hair, or perhaps it's a large jellyfish. Wielding your skimming net with authority, you probe around in the vat, completely ignoring the corpse of a king who keeps getting in the way of your search. Boy, the alcohol fumes sure are strong in here. Vat 13. Indistinct shapes are floating in the murky liquid. None of the creatures are close enough to the glass to see what they are. Could it be? Yes. It's heavy. It's shiny. It's real gold. It's got a sharp point at one end. It's... The Dagger of Amon-Ra. 